Did you know that in less than 50 years, we were able to decrease the number of children who suffered from polio by 99%? It's amazing, right? There was a group of people in the late 70s who believed that no child should suffer from this crippling disease. So they fought against all the odds to find a vaccine, and they did it. They won. That was our parents' generation. And I find it astonishing that a group of people could work together in such a short period of time to make such a massive impact in the world. I'm not obviously here to talk about the eradication of polio. I'm not a scientist or a doctor. I've worked for nonprofits almost my whole life here in the United States, and I've spent a lot of time in South Africa and Malawi, always fighting poverty. I'm also a disaster responder. That, meant, that means in times of natural disaster, I would deploy to a community and help them as they recover and rebuild. I've had an amazing journey, and I've met some wonderful people. But in my career, I've also seen a lot of suffering, and I've seen some indescribable poverty. And I'll be honest, that poverty has never made sense to me. And in the core of my being, I just knew it didn't have to be this way. But it wasn't until I moved to Haiti that I was able to experience for myself what it is like when a group of people work together to fight for justice. It was January 25th, 2010, when our plane landed on the broken tarmac of Haiti's International Airport. Against the advice of my family and nearly all my friends, I jumped on the first plane I could to help Haiti after the earthquake that destroyed the country. I'm a trained disaster responder, so of course this is a natural reaction for me. But I wouldn't do my story justice if I didn't tell you that there was something very different about this disaster for me. I felt this calling so deep in my soul that I absolutely could not rest until I got there. And it didn't matter how devastating those images were from CNN or how those voices in my head said, really, Julie, what are you gonna do to help those people? None of that mattered because I would not rest until I got there. And so you know those times in your life when determination supersedes logic? Well, that's what happened to me, and 13 days later, I was standing in the fire and rubble of Haiti's capital city. Now, even though I was following this calling and doing what I really believed was right, the moment that the plane touched the ground, I knew I was in way over my head. It was about 11 o'clock at night when the doors of the plane opened, and before I could even gather my things together, dozens of Americans who had been on the ground since the earthquake hit, ran onto our plane and they were covered in dust and blood, and their eyes were wild, and I was absolutely petrified. And I kind of just froze and stood there. But then I realized that these guys were actually the lucky ones. They were getting on this plane and they were leaving. I was about to enter a space where a million people had suffered the same tragedy and had nowhere to go. So I said, OK, Julie, suck it up. Let's do this. Let's go. And since I went to Haiti without an organized relief group, which was my first mistake of many mistakes I made on this journey, by the way, I frantically found the two men that I had met from Orlando. We made our way off the plane, and we entered into this sea of chaos. The dust and the rubble was just completely overwhelming. It seemed to take hours, but we finally found our driver, and we began the next phase of our journey. And the streets weren't streets. They were just the ruins and the remains of a city. And we zigged and zagged carefully throughout the people and the, and the tents. And when we arrived at what used to be the home of our host, there was mattresses laid by the front door and the, room left on, the one room left unscathed by the earthquake. And they told us if another aftershock came, just to run outside as quickly as we could. It's been almost, what, seven years since the earthquake hit Haiti. And I've had a lot of time to process my experience, but I'll tell you, it's always been difficult for me to describe post-earthquake Haiti because for me, it was this incredible combination of misery and hope all mashed into a single experience. And my first night was a perfect example of that. As I laid on that mattress, I could hear the worshiping of Haitian women. And it was so beautiful and so unexpected. But it was intermixed with these dogs that cried endlessly, and every once in a while you'd hear a person scream out of pain, and sometimes it was even a kid, and my mind just couldn't process what was happening. And I am telling you that there is not a degree or a reality show that can prepare someone for this. 
I was not prepared for this. The next morning, I was working at that medical clinic and I was handing out expired Tylenol to people who needed amputations. And I was quickly spiraling into this sea of hopelessness. And I remember that I just prayed for help. And the only comfort I got was I, so I heard, Julie, just listen. For once in your life, don't act, don't do, just listen. And I knew at that moment I had to leave the clinic and I knew that I had to carry on. So I mustered up all the strength that God gave me and I left the clinic and I went back town to the city center where there was this giant relief center set up for, for volunteers. I spent most of my days there handing out bottles of water and tarps into local tent camps. And then it happened, the day that I listened. I was working in this tent camp and I felt a hand touch my arm and this woman looked at me and she said, Blanc, my papa's went low, when we live to try. And she smiled and kind of patted my hair and then walked away. Later that day, I found out what she said was, white lady, I don't want any water, but I need a job. And those words just pierced me, right? I mean, it was, it was, that was it. And I became obsessed with her and with this idea. So much so that I did what any rational person would do, and I went back to the United States, I quit my job, I sold my house. <laughs> and a few weeks later, I relocated permanently to Haiti. I had about $7,000, a better tent, and still no plan. I never did see that lady that wanted a job again, but I did continue to harass anyone who would talk to me about creating jobs in Haiti. And then one day, I heard that there was a like-minded woman living in a camp up the road, and she had started an orphanage for children who lost their parents in the earthquake. Jolina de la Roche. Now, Jolina is unlike anyone I've ever met in my life. She is stoic and brave and funny and kind and just kind of like the perfect person. And now she's one of my best friends and she's my business partner. But on that day, Jolina in her jovial and reassuring way said, we need to create jobs in Haiti. She told me that she not only lost her home in the earthquake but also her small business. She said how grateful she was to all the relief agencies who provided so many things after the earthquake, how the very tent we were standing in was a gift from one of these agencies. But she told me that the distributions of oil and rice were fewer and further between. And she said, Julie, how will I continue to feed all these kids without a paycheck? I told Jolina that the same things were keeping me up at night. And I told her I'd been thinking a lot about my time in Malawi, Africa. That's where I saw people making and selling sandals from tires they found off the streets. Jolina grabbed both of my hands and said, we have tires all over Haiti and they burn them here as trash. And then she like squeezed my hands even tighter and said, I used to work in a factory and I know how to sew. And so at this point, I'm not sure who was more excited, Jolina or I, but I do know that neither one of us acknowledged the fact that we had absolutely no idea how to make footwear. <laughs> But honestly, it didn't even matter because the seed was sown and we decided that day that we were going to take back everything that the earthquake stole. So those conversations that started in Jolina's tent orphanage manifest themselves into this small job training center in the middle of the city. And it was made out of a tarp and some plywood we found in the streets. Um, I spent most of my days Googling, how do you make sandals from recycled tires? And if you've ever done that, then this image will look familiar. <laughs> And I thought, excellent, that's exactly what we're going to do. That's great, we're going to make those. And um, so me and Jolene and a few other Haitian women sat on the floor, and it's actually kind of ridiculous, cutting tires with razor blades. But we did it. And uh, 10 months after the earthquake, it was November, we actually came up with our first sandal prototype. But that was also the same month that we had a massive cholera outbreak in Haiti. And I mean, we really were just trying to be normal at this point. We were just trying to find tires and, and figure out shoe sizes and just kind of start rebuilding. But uh, the conditions that Haiti was throwing at us every day was making it so difficult, and we were really just a group of homeless women at this point. But we went to work every day. And surprisingly enough, people actually started to buy our sandals. And looking back seven years ago, I'm going to tell you why this is so outrageous. Actually, I'm going to show you why this is so outrageous. So this was our first prototype sandal. 
literally a tire and some inner tube. And not only was it ugly, but they were uncomfortable and heavy. And actually, when the sun would hit the, would hit the rubber, it would burn your feet. It was, it was like, <laughs> like ridiculous. But in my defense, I was a disaster relief worker, not a shoe designer, obviously. <laughs> But the fact that we went to work every day allowed us to do a lot of growing and changing, and not just in the sandals that we produced, but in the foundation of who we were. I'll tell you that that $7,000 ran out pretty quickly. And so I had a master's degree in nonprofit management. I did what I knew, and I started a charity, Rebuild Globally. And Rebuild Globally became the catalyst for all this great work and impact that we were able to have in Haiti. But I always knew that we weren't just a charity. We were different. But back then, it was really hard to figure out like, how to describe what we were doing and who we were. So let me tell you who we became. Within a few years, Rebuild Globally incubated a for-profit, Haitian-owned and operated company, Dume Designs. Dume means two hands in French. And we built a company based on what we were able to create with our own two hands, despite all the odds. And now I'm sure you can imagine that Having these types of organizations was different, difficult, but it made sense to me. Using a nonprofit and a for-profit to fight the poverty all around us, this was actually making sense, and it was working. Rebuild Globally was training people for job readiness, but in a country with a 40% unemployment rate, it couldn't end there. It absolutely couldn't end there. So we created the other side, Dume Designs, a direct pipeline to dignified employment with maternity and paternity leave, access to health insurance, paid vacation. This is how we saw radical transformation in our community. You know, Haiti gives you a run for your money. <laughs> and there's something really amazing about Haiti because she has this incredible spirit. And I want to tell you about the most challenging time for me. It was March of 2012. And after years of not having a car, I was finally able to afford one. And you won't believe this, but it legitimately blew up. It, like, caught on fire. <laughs> this happens, apparently. And if that wasn't bad enough, four days later, our workshop was robbed. Generator, inverter, batteries, gone, so we had no access to electricity. Later that month, there was a flood, and all the materials that we had left were ruined. And then I got dengue fever, and by the end of March, I was so sick of being sick, and I was so broke, I just didn't think I could take it anymore. And I remember I walked into the workshop and I sat down next to Jolina and I just started to cry uncontrollably. And Jolina let me cry for about one minute. <laughs> and then she took her thumbs and she wiped away the tears and said, Okay, Julie, Anale, back to work. And that's Haiti. That's the spirit of Haiti. That is Jolina, and that is what gave me the courage to carry on, and that is what allowed this group of untrained women to form this ethical fashion company that's profitable, that private labels for designers like Kenneth Cole, that's opened up a second job training center in the middle of a refugee camp. It's been an incredible journey. You know, and I'll tell you, I said earlier that it wasn't easy in the beginning, and it still isn't easy. As most of you probably know, we were recently hit with a massive Category 5 hurricane. After years of responding to disasters in Haiti, some that have made national news and some that only we know about, here's what I've learned. Hurricanes, earthquakes, disasters of all sorts will come and go. Hurricane Matthew came, and he left as they always will. But if we become the people who focus on creating jobs and business, communities all around the world will be better able to protect themselves and recover from these disasters that are sure to come. I think that it's time that we recognize that with the right support, Haiti can help herself. And I also think that it's time for us to recognize that no one needs to live in extreme poverty in this day and age. If each one of us harnessed our unique potential to make the world a more just and sustainable place, someday our kids will stand on a stage somewhere telling the world how our generation fought extreme poverty and that we won. Thank you.